<laughs> is anybody in love? Who's in love? Who, is anybody newly in love? Six years? Who's, who's long time love? Like way too long. <laughs> okay, so there's a there's a part I have in here. I wanted some people that were newly in love, but we don't have any people. So is anybody dating that is like really early in a relationship? No. Oh, wait, you got one. Oh. Sort of? Wait, what's a sort of mean? Sorry? Is you say sort of in a relationship? We're not really a relationship, but we're dating. Oh. Uh, uh, so tell us about it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she might like to lie down on a sofa. Uh, <laughs> how long have you been together? How long? I mean, we went on three days. So. Oh, three days. You, but you're not in love yet, are you? No. No. Okay. All right. So you're not. You're not gonna. You're probably not gonna count. You probably still have your brain. <laughs> We're looking for somebody who's lost their brain. Oh boy. Marsha. 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 I've been something for six years. Six years? Yeah. So that, I guess compared to this crowd, that's kind of nice. Yeah. I need less than two. Yeah. I'm talking like six months. All right. So we're gonna probably have to skip that whole part of that. But we'll go. We'll go ahead and go forward anyway. So we're gonna talk about. Um. So I got a couple questions. You guys, do you know, do you, do you know, how do you know when you're in love? Oh. <laughs> is love one thing? How's that? We'll start with that. Is love, do you want to go ahead? It overwhelms you. It, ah, very good. That's a good one. So is love one thing? No. Does love change? Yes. yes. Very good. All right. So we're going to talk about the actual stages of love. And I call it love, but there's it's not actually really love all the time. Come on. Why is this not clicking for us? There you go. So from the research that I've done, we can break down love into four different stages. Attraction, dating, the stage of falling in love, and then what I call true love. And so it sounds like most of you are in that true love stage. Some of you might be getting out of love. I'm not sure stage. Don't uh, but um, so, but it all starts with attraction. Attraction is very different from falling in love. And, and, and <laughs> <laughs> there's something going on back there. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about attraction. So when I do these things, I usually wear my red, so you should be pretty much very attracted to me right now. The, the color that we find that our senses are what causes us to be attracted, particularly for women. Women have, um, we, we find attraction with all, the, all five senses. Men, it's a little bit different. So it, the interesting part is that men have 25% more neuro, uh, neurons in the visual cortex, so they place a higher percentage on attraction, physical attractiveness, than they do the rest of it. But with women, we actually use our eyes, we use our ears, we're, we're, we're trying to listen to uh, the voice. We can go on a date and we can like everything about that person, but when we go to kiss them, if it doesn't have a, the right chemicals, we are we repulsed by them? And everybody's like, yeah, I've been there. <laughs> I went on that date. We also sense by our noses. We have a thing called the uh, major histocompatibility complex. It's actually part of the immune system, so we are more attracted to people of opposite immune systems, which makes perfect sense because if you have children from that union, they would have a better complement of immune cells than you would if you were closer. It's also a reason why you're repulsed by people that are too close to you. Um, I had a woman one time, she goes, can you tell me why my I can't stand the smell of my son's gym socks? Mm. And I'm like, that's why. So you're, just, you're too close uh, in 
genetically, and that's why you'll be repulsed by that. So, anyway, attraction. So we, men particularly are more visually attracted. So men are gonna be, if you're gonna do a dating site tonight, you would want to put your best red dress on or your outfit because he's going to be more attracted to the color red. You're going to write it down, okay? Take notes. See, we knew we were going to do the do. Women, on the other hand, so men are going to be, they're going to like, they like the red a lot less than the white. They don't want the, like the whole pure thing. <laughs> don't laugh, ladies, because this next picture, you're going to go, which one are you more attracted to? Oh, boy. Come on, that's not fair. Yeah, exactly. I don't You're know, like, they're both working for uh, Exactly. <laughs> Either one. Both of them. Oh, nice. It's actually the same guy, but the same. one guy is, is the one guy with a little mis more mysterious tends to be, get the higher votes for attractiveness. Ew. 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 Now with this crowd? No. Well, there's a, there's a, there could be. I mean, you, you guys are wiser now. So if you're younger, we're gonna ask the little one in the back. Oh, okay, good, very good, all right. Um, the, re the reason be, this is the reason behind the whole bad boy thing the motorcycles, is there's a thing called, <laughs> she's raising her hand. <laughs> I can, because first of all, attraction has nothing to do with love. It's just attraction. But attraction is actually based on fear. The neurotransmitter we get is norepinephrine, which is the fight or flight response. So the more afraid you are, so if I walk in here, if I have a guy come in with a gun, you're gonna definitely be more attracted to me because your fight or flight's been kicked in. So that, that's, it's called misattribution of attraction. So there's a study done in, uh, I think it was Bookstone, New York, and they put two, they put two people on bridges. They took a group, on a rickety bridge and a, a group on a bridge that was over Babylon Brook. And what they did was they had the person walk out to the, the middle and then they had her meet somebody else and they registered the attraction. So the person on the scariest bridge was more attracted to the person that met him in the middle than the one on the gentle bridge. So they realized that it was the, it's called misattribution attraction. It's the whole basis behind the tunnel of love. You get on a little boat, it's dark, you're scared, you come out the other end, you're in love, right? Tunnel of love. <laughs> Why are you, you know, we were just talking at lunch about how people get scared on boats. Why are you on a yacht club with men on boats? <laughs> now you know your life, now you know what happened, right? But that is, that is part of attraction. The thing about attraction is it's fight or flight, which is meant to wear off. It's just to get your attention. It's nature's way of going, hey, there's something interesting happening here. You should pay attention. But it, it goes away. Our problem is when we think that's love. So there's people out there that think that initial response is love, and so they try to keep finding that. Those are those people that get in and out of relationships all the time, they're like bounce, 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 the next guy. Or they end up, you guys know Pamela Anderson and Tommy Lee, remember that? Mm -hmm. So there's what, there are the perfect um, attraction couple. They're, they had an on again, off again relationship. <laughs> they were bouncing back and forth and it, it was drama based. So in order to get that feeling, you have to keep up in the drama. So by the end of that relationship, about two years later, he ended up, Tommy Lee did six months in the county jail for domestic violence. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the kind of relationships you have when you misunderstand attraction in love. So now we know attraction has nothing to do with love, so let's talk about love. So, is attraction just a precursor? I may turn love or it may not. So how do we fall in love? Now I did a TED talk on how your brain falls in love. If you wanna look it up, please go ahead. It's on uh, YouTube. I'm not gonna go through the whole science behind it, 
But basically what happens is men and women fall in love differently. So I'm giving you the cliff note version of this. So women, do, everybody likes the dopamine. Both of us are on the dopamine. The dopamine is when you're all excited. It's the same thing as like when you play Candy Crush and you like get that little, that little high. You wanna see them, you wanna go out on a date with them. Your dopamine keeps going up and up and up. It gets to a point where it goes up and up until you reach a point where we fall in love. It's an enzymatic effect. So we see with enzymes, they go up, 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 and then boom. And we see this drop, and we see, actually see a drop in falling in love. And I'll explain how that, what happens then. But for women, it's dopamine and oxytocin. You know how you get oxytocin? <clears throat> oxytocin we get every time we are, we tr it's, the, um, it's the hormone of cuddling, but it's also the hormone of trust. So when we, get to, when we get to know him and we trust him, it's also the reason why guys with a sense of humor do better because you can't laugh. When you laugh, your oxytocin goes up. You can't laugh without trusting the person. So used car salesmen are not gonna make you laugh, trust me. <laughs> so every time you kiss, cuddle, date, get to know him, your oxytocin goes up. But here's the thing, oxytocin goes up a lot. With, with orgasm. So if you sleep with them relatively quickly, boom, you could fall in love. Which is fine, except he doesn't fall in love that way. Uh, nah, boom, dum, dum. <laughs> he falls in love with, uh, still dopamine, but testosterone, uh, his testosterone was up, but the vasopressin, which is very similar to uh, oxytocin, except that testosterone blocks oxytocin, so that's why vasopressin is, is what we see in males. Vasopressin goes up every time he is sexually desirous, but it drops rapidly when he's sexually satisfied. Uh, 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 so the cool, the so the trick to this is get him to want it, but not give it to him. Is anyone? Guys here. <laughs> so my whole tech is my whole tech talk is what my grandmother said. My grandmother said if you want him to fall in love, and the here's the here's the thing. You if you want him to fall in love, you have to wait for him to commit. And I'm like, what does commitment have to do with anything? And the commitment here is we see the testosterone up, right? When a man commits to his woman, the testosterone drops. That makes him more susceptible to the vasopressin and oxytocin. That makes him bond. So when a woman has sex, she bonds. When a man has sex, he may or may not bond. Often he, he won't bond. So he'll go, we call it the Coolidge effect. There's a story of Calvin Coolidge who went on a chicken farm and he was a touring the chicken farm with his wife and he looked over, or the wife looked over and saw this rooster being amorous with his hen. <laughs> <laughs> Mrs. Hey, this is that's not the funny part. What are you guys doing? <laughs> <laughs> so the Mrs. Coolidge goes to the attendant, she goes, Is that rooster like that all the time? And the attendant says, Yes, ma'am, all day, every day. She goes, Ooh, tell Mr. Cool President Coolidge that. So the attendant goes back and he goes, President Coolidge, my wife wants to point out that hen to you, that rooster to you. And he looks over and he's being amorous with the hen and he goes, I see, son. Is he like that all the time? He goes, yes, sir, all day, every day. And he goes, one last question, son. Is it the same old hen every day? Uh-huh. He says, no, sir. It's a new hen every day. day. <laughs> Go back and tell Mrs. Coolidge that. And that became the Coolidge effect. We can see that, and I can take a box of rats, and I can throw a male in, He'll have sex with all the females until he's exhausted, mm -hmm. and he'll lay in the corner. They can lick and try to entice him. He won't move until I put a new, fresh, new female in, and then he's up and at him. The dopamine bursts up, and it's called the Coolidge effect. So, so that is that is part of the the I guess the warning I give to younger women is like if you if you have sex too early, it could actually dissuade. It can prevent falling in love hmm. in some cases. It, it doesn't work in all cases. If he thinks you were way out of his league, he's gonna continue on with the whole dopamine and vasopressin. 
but then you probably don't want him. So that's that's another thing I see a lot too. It's like the ones I want, I want my, you know, want me, whatever. But anyway, um, so that's falling in love. So that's how you fall in love. So now you're wondering what happens when you fall in love. So we were going to do this little quiz, but we're not going to we're not going to be able to do it because we don't have any newly fall in love people. But we'll explain that. So we're going to talk about your brain in love. I like to call this this section of my talk temporary insanity. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where I was going to ask for some volunteers, and we were going to do a little quiz, but we're not going to do the quiz. They're little really silly questions. So the questions are like, if you have three frogs in a log, one jumps off. How many you have left? It's like right, two, right? So in the famous clown that first named the Ronald, Ronald McDonald. So these are just simple questions, right? What's a pound of feathers or a pound of gold? They're the same. And so we're not going to do the War of 1812. What year? <laughs> so why, why do I ask those silly questions? Because the person that's newly in love never gets them. It's always the person who's been either out of in love for a long time or not, not in love. So why do you ask, right? Why does that happen? Let's talk about your brain. Let's talk about your brain on love. So when we fall in love, as I said, we have this activation that occurs. We have this enzymatic effect. We see this drop down, and we see a total change in your neurotransmitters, and we see a total change in your brain. Oh, there's my glasses. This is not a real brain, <laughs> just in case you were wondering. But this is, this is what happens to your brain when you fall in love. So when we fall in love, we see a deactivation of the prefrontal cortex. That's why you're not as smart anymore and you can't figure out what the year of 1812 was. <laughs> And we also see a deactivation of the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. That's the part of the brain that judges the other person. So when your girlfriend falls in your love and you're realizing and you're wondering why she's with that weirdo, that's yeah. what happens. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> and not only that, we see a loss of the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of the brain that sounds the alarm. So even if she sees something weird about this guy, it doesn't register. So she looks in his trunk. He's got a shot off shotgun, a ski mask. He says he's doing winter, winter hunting in Naples and she believes it. <laughs> That's why it's gone. Where does it go? Is it just it, no, it just de deactivates. So we don't deactivating. We don't see uh, we don't see the act activity level that we used to. So we, this is the ventral medial prefrontal cortex. So she sees him as being wonderful, no matter what. And then we see parts of the parietal lobe and the temporal lobe over here. So this is what you're left with. You're left with pretty much the rip, the primitive brain. That's the part of the, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, when you, the primitive part is all about primitive needs. So in that part of the phase of the relationship, you're usually just having a, eating a lot and having a lot of sex because you're basically just primitive, right? Your temporal medial, uh, your temporal prior lobes are associated with an increase in selfishness. So um, you're going to be less selfish in that relationship. And then it's also, um, you're going to focus on the now. So that whole relationship just becomes really important. This is when you first fall in love. Who wants to guess how long this lasts? Hmm. Eight, 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 a week? No. no. Six months. Six months. Nope. Two years? Two years. Two years. I'm jumping ahead though. Here's the amygdala. That's that little part we said that we lost. So this guy makes look, looks good. Yeah. Yeah. No problems here. I don't see anything. <laughs> okay. So that was that's what happens to your brain. At the same time, we see a shift in your neurotransmitters. So pop quiz. 
I'm a professor, so I always do pop quizzes. Pop quiz, serotonin, the hormone of happiness, up or down? You would think, right? You would think, no, you all fail. Oh. Down. It drops to the level of someone with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. That's why you're obsessed in the relationship. It's also one of the reasons why when you break up, it becomes very painful because serotonin dropping is also part of depression. So if, if, you, know, if, you, if you get into a relationship early on and you, when you're obsessed like that, you don't understand uh, why you find yourself like rattling around in his trash cans at night going, you know, where, where is he, where is he? It's the serotonin. All right, next one. Cortisol, that's the stress hormone. Up or down? I get stress hormone, I heard down, down, up. It is up, it is up, it makes you crazy. That's why you're like all nervous. You guys probably feel it when you, when you first fall in love. You're like, uh, and you can't wait to see each other and you're just like all excited. Next pop quiz, testosterone, up or down? Jeez. No, wait a second, you said it went down at a certain point. So. Yep. So this is a trick question because it goes down in men, right when you fall in love, and it goes up in women. So then she is much more amorous mm. in, that, in that phase of falling in love. So the whole Samson and Delilah, she did not need to cut his hair because he is testosterone drops, he's gonna lose his strength anyway. <laughs> <laughs> And then oxytocin, oxytocin is the, the cuddle hormone and it goes up in both people. It goes about, and it's interesting, the research shows that oxytocin, when it goes up in a man, so the, for the woman it's really being about, it's about the bonding, because it's called the, bond, the bonding hormone. Um, and for men, it's actually protective. He's less likely to look at other women. So when his oxytocin is up. So if you have any issues, you can actually buy oxytocin spray, put it on his pillow at night, <laughs> and don't worry about it. And then endorphins. The endorphins go up in each person, and that kind of has a, an interesting effect. You know, just a little bit more on the amorous side. And then we also see a mental, uh, it's like a miracle growth for your brain. We see a uh, nerve growth factor and brain derived neurotrophic factor that um, increase in your brain. So it actually, some of the, um, creates new neurotransmit or neuropaths. So I think it's more about like learning the other person and, and memorizing and remembering them. So all of this is really kind of happening to help you to bond with the other person. We also see in brain scans, the activity in your uh, parietal lobes is almost like cocaine. What we see when people take cocaine, it's that same like nervous activity. Oh, there it is, and there was the answer. It's all designed to keep you close to another person, put them in the best light, lower your natural defenses, and make you more vulnerable to the other person. Because without this amygdala, you're with, well, without your ventral medial prefrontal cortex, you're not really judging him. So you're not making like putting, pushing him off. And without this, you're, everything is great. Everything is golden. There is, there is one thing I should say, if with your amygdala, women or anybody that has had trauma in the past will have a bigger amygdala. And it can be actually more difficult for them to get in a relationship because it will block, this will block them from uh, being able to get close to somebody else. So, but all this fun must come to an end. <laughs> That's all about falling in love. That's the first two years of a relationship. And what we see is um, after about two years, your brain starts coming back. Mother Nature starts putting things back online and then all of a sudden, <laughs> your brain comes back. 
then you start realizing things you hadn't noticed before. Uh huh. The way he eats his cereal and he smacks his lips. And why do you have to chew that loud? Do you have to keep breathing all the time? <laughs> Your ventral medial prefrontal cortex comes back and it had, it gets busy. It starts judging big time. So what we see is, uh, do I have that one? Let me see. Oh, let me keep going. This can cause stress. Just a little bit of stress. So what we see is, uh, this is a research from Dr. Helen Fisher, and what she discovered is that about the two-year mark is when the majority of divorces occur. So if you can make it through that two-year mark, your chances of divorcing obviously become less. So within that two-year mark, we have a, a large portion of divorces because all of a sudden your brain comes back. So now that what what, what, what happened up to this point was Mother Nature was helping you out. She was lowering your defenses. She was letting you get close to somebody. She was building the neural paths to get close to somebody. And then you can't live your life without your prefrontal cortex. You can't live your life without knowing what year 1812 was, right? <laughs> so she says, I'm gonna give you your brain back. And now the responsibility of love becomes up to you. but it doesn't have to end that way. <laughs> true love is possible. So how, what is true love? True love is actually making the decision to be with somebody and continuing to love them. So what we see, when we fell in love, I said the prefrontal cortex was gone, so the activity was in the lower brain. It was in the more primitive brain. And now, in people that are in loving long-term relationships, we see the activity in the prefrontal cortex. That was a, it wasn't even working back then, but that's where it is now. We also see activity back here. So we had the activity up here that was in the, uh, like cocaine, like the drugs cocaine. Now we see activity back here, which has the uh, neurotransmitters for, or the, uh, the uh, receptacles for uh, opioids, the opioid receptors. So it's more like heroin. Mm. So instead of cocaine, which is crazy and jittery, heroin's like mellow and nice and sweet. So long-term love is actually more mellow, more, uh, we see it actually helps with pain. So there, there's less pain in real love. Um, and it's better for long-term health and relationships. So I said, now it's up to you. So your brain activity changes. We just said the brain activity. Um, we were in the primitive brain and now we are in the higher functioning brain. That was not accessible a couple years ago, but now we're here. This makes a decision of <clears throat> when this occurs, we'll start seeing the activity here. If we see the activity in the prefrontal ventral medial ventral medial prefrontal cortex, that means you're, you're judging them. If we see the activity up in the front, that means you're more loving. So how do you get from being judging to more loving? You've got to make that decision. So it's what you think about. What you think about is really gonna affect. If you're gonna notice that he keeps leaving those damn socks on the floor, <laughs> you're, it's going to push it back out of the prefrontal cortex. But if you can notice that these are the things I love about this person, this is the things I'm grateful for about this person, that can change the neuroactivity. Long-term love shares neural connections with morals, ethics, empathy, brotherly love, and unconditional love. So when we're practicing those type of aspects, they say the Haas law is what uh, neurotransmitters, what neurons fire together, 
What is it? Yes, fire together, wire together. Thank you. I'll, I'll give you a tip later for that. <laughs> fire together, wire together. So when we're practicing these, we're actually, we're actually reinforcing a loving relationship. We're practicing more loving relationships because that's where the activity, where love is found in your brain after a certain period of time. Long-term loving relationships are happier, healthier. Men in long-term uh, loving relationships live 250 times longer than their single cohorts. Whoa. Wow. Yeah, so if you, if you don't like them that much, divorce them, see what happens. <laughs> God didn't say that. That was somebody else back there. They're, um, they are more altruistic, they're caring, compassionate, more satisfying, and they provide for better lives. Oh, this is the this is my quote. I gotta put my glasses on here. When you love, it affects the mirror neurons. So the mirror neurons are the part of the brain that so I can like uh, paint something or I can make a dish or something like that, and you can watch me do it and you can learn by watching me do it. You don't have to actually do it for you to to learn how to do it. Those that's because you have mirror neurons. The mirror neurons can pick up an activity and be able to see it. So when you when you're loving and you're in a loving relationship, the mirror neurons are picked up by people around you and actually affect the people around you. So the uh, in so it, when you're in love, it affects the mirror neurons or people around you. In this way, when you practice, each person expands the love around them. So if you want to be, you probably had this experience too before. If you're in a relationship and you had some people that are in a bad relationship, it can actually make your relationship feel uncomfortable if you're around them too much. But if you're with people that are in a loving relationship, you actually feel more bonded to your person that you're with. That is because of your mirror neurons. So what activities you participate in, what you think of, and who you hang around with can really affect uh, your loving relationship. And it's all up to you. So that, is, that actually went faster than I thought. <laughs> that is my presentation for today. Questions? Yes. No, I'm a biologist, so I'm strictly like the science. I have, I've done I've done co coaching, some day coaching with women, but I'm more on the uh, most of my research has been um, like going through the stacks of, of research and compiling it and putting it together for a theory. But I've done a little bit of testing. I actually work. I was working on a test. If I can collect a male's testosterone, I can tell if he is in a committed relationship or if he's in pursuit mode, meaning that he's cheating or thinking about cheating. Oh, so that kind of leads me to my next question. Um, but what you're saying here is that in, as the relationship proceeds and you hit that pinnacle of two years and it starts to go down, then the continuation of the relationship is a choice, not just a reaction to what's going on around you. And so when a person is in therapy or getting advice or whatever, um, can the therapist do a brain scan or do a blood test, like you're saying, to see if that person is actually working in the right direction or if they're sliding back even farther, do actual physical tests to be done on them? Sure. Yeah, it's possible. You can do a brain scan and see where the activity is. And they've done that before where they've done, um, they've done some brain scans where they asked different questions or they flashed up different pictures and they would get the activity in different areas and then they could kind of decipher to figure out exactly where they were at, where they were at in the relationship, what they were really focusing on. So I don't know exactly like, you know, how you would do it, but you put up like a picture of you two on a ski trip and then the next picture is the dirty sock on the floor. <laughs> See which one is really getting the activity going. But is there, you could, there's a possibility. I don't, I don't have that, that capability, but there are some um, 
uh, brain scan facilities around here that there's a, there's a possibility of being able to do that. You could probably definitely see the difference between early love and in later love. And if somebody has been in a relationship for a couple of years and they're still in a, the primitive part of the brain, then you know that they're um, maybe, maybe thinking about getting out of the relationship. So in the testosterone test, we can take a male's saliva test and I can send it off to the lab and I can tell you if he's thinking about uh, leaving the relationship. So there was a study done by the United States, the United States um, Force, I think it was the Army, I can't remember exactly. But what happened was they were doing routine tests on all these guys and they got to the point where they're like, on these routine tests, they could figure out, they, they got to the point where they're like, when the, when the labs came back, they're like, this guy's gonna leave his relationship. Inevitably, within a year, they left the relationship. So they made the connection between testosterone. And so as his testosterone started going up, they realized he was leaving the relationship. So it was going into pursuit mode, meaning that he was getting interested in seeing somebody else. Did I mess up? No. <laughs> Stay behind your podium. Sorry. <laughs> my, my the big difference is when you fall in love when you're in your early 20s and you fall in love when you're in your 60s, it's a very different experience because when you're in your 20s, you're completely like, you know, practically a virgin, a new person to that feeling. So you're much more vulnerable because of So I think as you get older, don't you feel like your brain is mature? And you've gotten more, like, there's an expression like, oh, does he check all the boxes? You know, you have boxes to check as you get older. It's very different. I feel like love as a mature person is very different. I mean, I was in love when I was 23. It's very different than falling in love with someone when you're, you know, in the 60s. So I just want you to comment on that. Because we're all, you know, if you're a smart, practical woman, that factors into decisions you make about the relationship. You don't have time to waste. You don't have time to, oh, you know. Are you in a relationship? I am, and I'm in a happy relationship. How long have you been in? Six years. Six years? Okay, so you Six. were the... No, no, no. I, I was with my ex, my ex-husband for 36 years, dating and married. It was my decision to leave. It was a very hard decision to make, but it was a good one. But I'm just, you know, I think this is an important part because all of us, well, with the exception of one adorable, <laughs> we're all, you know, mature women. A lot of us have been in relationships for a long time, some not. But I think that factors into this whole thing because as you, you make older, a great point. You make a great point. And one, of, I was, she'd asked the question if I did like therapy and I did relationship coaching for a while. So the relationship coaching, the, the first book I wrote actually was about, uh, it's called The Broken Picker Fixer for choosing the wrong men. And one of the things that I had women do was really decide what they wanted. Because when you're early on, you fall. You could fall in love with anything because you don't. You, you don't really have. You don't have a barometer of what you want. But when you get older, you now know. I'm not gonna. I'm not marrying that guy with the ankle bracelet again. I'm not doing that. <laughs> not going there, right? <laughs> but and you and you have these boxes. You're like, I want to have. He's he's got to have a job, or he's got to have income. He's got you know. He had. He has to be breathing, you know? <laughs> you, got you got parameters, right? You that might be tough in Naples, but we can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> so you're, when, what you're doing is now you're taking the time to think about it, and you're less likely to just jump in. So when you're younger, you're more likely to take like a risk. But now you know better. Sure. So you're not gonna be like, you're going, mm, I'm not, you know, you you might look good on, uh, you might look good physically, but on paper, no. You know, Cause you're, you're looking at the rest of the whole picture. So yes, there is, a, there is a difference and it's because you become wiser. And that's another part of the brain that's not well, see, that's the thing. Here, this is a this is a fantastic point she's making, ladies. You're this is all happening in your prefrontal cortex. These decisions, that's your executive functioning. 
if you jump into a relationship and have sex too early, that could come offline. So you lose that ability to be discerning. So you want to make those decisions before you get into the relationship. Yes, yes. After about 40, crazy don't look no good anymore. <laughs> when, when you're young, that looks really cute and cuddly, and they're like, we're going to take the risk. But after a guy gets to be about 40, he, he's learned his lesson. And he's like, mm -mm. So a lot of women have to grow up at 40 and then realize that they're not, what you could get away with when you were cute in, in bubbly, you can't get away with as you get older. It just doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. So um, they get a little, dis, they get a little discerning also. And they start, they start factoring other things in and it's not just become so physical. There's still the physical, but because they've learned, they, they're willing to sit down and learn about you um, and not just judge it on the basis of the physical. I have a question. In my practice, uh, I have people that have affairs. Mm -hmm. So what happens in the brain? Does it go from the back to the front or are they completely finished? Like well, it, de like it depends. So here's what happens with a man. When a man commits to a woman, his testosterone drops, right? That's that's the whole, he becomes like the whole dad bod thing, you know, it becomes lackadaisical. He loses some of his uh, edge. He loses that stuff that he had, you know, and he kind of he kind of feels like he's, he's, he's not there anymore. And then all of a sudden this woman comes along and goes, hey, and he goes, what the hell just happened? <laughs> and his testosterone just went up a little. And he goes, that felt pretty good. And he'll keep following her and she'll like, okay. And it goes up a little bit more. And next thing you know, he's like in pursuit. He's like not even realizing what's happening. And it's because his testosterone had tanked so bad that she's sparking it to move up. And that's what's really getting him going. Now, how can you prevent that? If you're if you're the female, if you're the if you're the wife, one of the things you can do, you're gonna hate this. You're gonna hate this suggestion. Oh boy. But he's gotta be your hero. Yeah, see I knew it. I knew it. Yep, you got if you can make him I mean, and you know what? Here's the word you gotta say, ready? Two of them. Thank you. Yeah, who's his ego? I, well, I call, I actually call my husband the world's greatest husband. He's, because he is. Of course, I would find the world's greatest husband. <laughs> exactly. But it, the, oftentimes that's what hap, what's happening. And they, they might not even, we see a lot of times in affairs, the guy doesn't even love the other woman. He still loves his partner. He's only after the other woman because there's this physical response in his body that's prompting him to go in that direction. So what you need to do is get him a gym membership and say thank you and stop that shit. <laughs> Unless he has an affair with a trainer, then you're in trouble. Yeah, boy. <laughs> exercise, boosts the, exercise boosts the testosterone also. But there are medications too. Yeah, you can, you can boost the testosterone. So those are tricky, though, because when you artificially boost it, are you creating a, a, a uh, yeah, are you, are you prompting him to get to the point where he's going to start going off to have an affair? We don't know. The data on that is not out enough. But we see, here's the interesting part. So if a man commits to a woman, his testosterone drops. It doesn't work in a homosexual relationship. So a homosexual relationship, the man's testosterone stays up the whole time. So one of the things they say often, there's a like an anecdotal thing that a man is not uh, committed, uh, faithful in a, a homosexual relationship, and the, the biology kind of pans that out because he never really drops down. Well, that's that is interesting. Yes, ma'am. Is there an age, an age of men that who's someone who would normally have affairs? Yeah, as they get older, their, their testosterone naturally drops. So Mother Nature, again, is helping us out. <laughs> so after about, 
His, um, his highest is about 20, and it starts dropping from there. Oh. Yes. When is our highest? Well, our, our highest. <laughs> Yeah, it can be 40s, yeah, right. Yeah, so that's 40s. the whole like boy toy. And I wasn't going to go there, but <laughs> <laughs> since we went there, that whole, um, what is it? Uh, what's the word for it? I guess it's a boy toy is the word for it. May, June, uh, Cougar. Cougar, yeah, that's the word. The whole, that explains the whole cougar thing. Particularly when a woman is leaving a relationship be, and she's had some damage, she is not going to be more likely to fall in love with sex because this amygdala, because of the, the problems that she had, is pretty big now. So she can actually now have sex with uh, impunity. So she's not going to more likely fall in love. So this 20-year-old this year old guy who's like, I'm just in it for the fun, and she's like, let's go. And it, then it works. Then it works. And she's probably not going to get pregnant either. So everybody's happy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, then you have menopause after that, so that's like your last hurrah. Hurrah. Yeah, yeah, you do get that last kick at the end of uh, premenopause when you're perimenopausal. Yeah. Let's not talk about that. We're not talking about any of that stuff. Let's talk about men. Who has more men questions? <laughs> more questions? Comments, complaints, concerns? Let's talk about men. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think that's all I have. I don't, do I have any other man? In, I get I get in trouble sometimes for like picking on men. Oh really? Yeah, they say I pick on men sometimes because my some of my anecdotes about like like he's got an ankle bracelet and stuff like that. I shouldn't pick on. Him. And then they're test they're dropping testosterone. I'm just quoting science, but then people get upset. You're being mean to him. I'm like I didn't drop the testosterone. You did. <laughs> <laughs> Is that everybody? Thank you so much. Thank you.